Okay, we are we are recording now. We've already prayed, so we should uh, read the passage. Let me read um, verses nine through twenty in Revelation chapter one. John writes, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay. That is the reading of God's word. Okay. Our mission, should we decide to accept it, is to complete that passage tonight. <laughs> um, where we left off was in the description in verses uh, 12 through 16, the description of the one like a son of man that John saw. And, and what we saw last week is that John evidently was using the, um, the description that Daniel gave in Daniel 10 of the man or the spirit being that uh, appeared to him and gave him his fourth and final vision. And in our notes, we have a little chart that compares Daniel's description of that spirit being in, uh, in Daniel 10, uh, verses 5 and 6, right alongside uh, John's description in Revelation 1, verses 13 through 16, uh, of the one like a son of man. And we saw that, that uh, there, the comparison was quite striking, except for one feature. Remember what that feature was? What feature did Daniel, I mean, did John go from Daniel 10 to Daniel 7 to describe? The hair of his head. The hair of his head. 
was it now in Daniel 7, the scene that we have is the Ancient of Days on his throne and one like a son of man on the clouds of heaven approaching that throne. Which figure did John go to to describe the hair of the one like a son of man in Revelation 1 that he saw? The Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days. He went to the Ancient of Days. And what's the significance of that, that, that John used the Ancient of Days? It is God. That Christ is, that the one like a son of man is God. Christ is God, exactly. So for, the, for almost the entire description, he described the glorified Christ in Revelation 1 in terms of that glorious shining being, spirit being in Daniel 10 that uh, appeared to Daniel and gave Daniel his fourth and final vision. But one feature he used to define, he used uh, the Ancient of Days, God the Father, to define the description of the glorified Son in Revelation 1. So, obviously, clearly, uh, what John was doing was, was um, describing Christ in his glorified state, okay? But by switching, for the hair, switching over to the Ancient of Days, <clears throat> he, he very deliberately indicated that this glorified being wasn't another glorious angel, but it was God himself, God the Son. Does that make sense? Okay. So the primary emphasis was on the gloriousness of Christ. Hey guys. Hey Nick. Hello, hello, Nick. Was on the glory of Christ, but he he used that one feature, his hair, to distinguish him from a from a glorious angel and to emphasize that this is the glorified son, God the Son. Okay. Pretty cool stuff. And um, so we were, um, we discussed his, his, the garment that he was wearing. He was wearing the robe of the high priest and, and um, the golden sash, the location, the fact that it was gold and the location of the sash being high up on his chest both of those features indicated that his priesthood was very high. And that doesn't surprise us because of how um, we're told in the book of Hebrews how Christ's uh, priesthood is like that of Melchizedek. And the, Melchized the Melchizedekan uh, priesthood is higher than the Aaronic. Uh, priesthood. Uh, and then we discussed his hair. Uh, we saw that hair was a symbol of wisdom. You get wisdom with age. Uh, and we saw that by describing it like white, like wool, like snow, that he was intensifying. It was intensely white hair. And uh, we commented that that is probably uh, to emphasize infinite wisdom, not just wisdom gained by long age, but wisdom owned because of everlasting age, because he's infinite. Uh, um, and so, uh, and we also noted 
that um, the reason that uh, wisdom and uh, white, white hair, white heads, uh, people with age and the wisdom that comes with age are not respected very much in our culture, but be, because with age, not only comes wisdom and white hair, but also declining beauty and powers, right? Physical powers. And our culture definitely ranks uh, beauty and physical power above uh, um, with the wisdom and dignity that comes with age. Uh, so they'll opt, uh, they, they'll, they'll turn their nose to um, the wisdom of age simply because of the declining powers and beauty that accompany. Just like today, huh, Mike? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. But we don't have to worry about that with the Lord. Um, no declining in his beauty and power. Uh, none. Okay, next. Uh, next on the agenda in John's description. In verse... Uh, at the end of verse 14, his eyes were like a flame of fire. Um, now, uh, this indicates his penetrating, all-seeing vision. He sees everything. Um, and, and we see, he, he, because of his penetrating, all-seeing vision, he sees into hearts. He sees everything. And we see that, we'll see that when we come to chapters two and three and read those messages to the seven churches. Every one of them, at, near the beginning of the letter, he uses, I know. I know. I know what's going on in your church. I know what's happening to you. I know what you're into. Uh, I know what's going on. I see. He sees everything. Um, so, what kind of an impact do you think that should have on, say, John seeing Christ, the glorified Christ, and uh, the churches um, uh, knowing, seeing, his penetrate while well, we don't get to see it we just we just get to imagine it from john's description um, um and then seeing how that plays out in his letters to the churches as well as we're going to see it all the way through the book of revelations the you know the uh, the sixth seal uh in uh, in Revelation 6, is, it, are the martyred saints under the altar saying, how long, O Lord? Uh, you know, we're going to, he, he knows their hearts and he tells, he answers their question beautifully. We're going to see that when we get there. Uh, but um, uh, we see it all the way through. Um, the book of Revelation. How how would that impact John and John's and these first century readers, these first readers of this book? The ones that are undergoing increasing persecution. That uh, that God God isn't God isn't blind to that. Like he he's aware of it. He he will come through on his word. I mean, yeah. He's not, yeah. not like he's ignoring them. Right, absolutely. Uh, he's, he's, uh, uh, so it's comforting. Yes. To them. It's comforting to them. And remember, we already saw in verse 12 that this one that 
has these this this penetrating all seeing vision uh, penetrating all seeing all knowing vision is also one who is walking amongst the lampstand one who is present among the churches so he's present among the churches and he sees everything there is nothing that escapes uh his uh vision and and knowledge and I'm, and I'm sure like they i mean the church has probably had in mind exodus you know the you know the exodus uh, out of the you know from you know the egyptians I'm yeah like, okay yeah i'll take god as you <laughs> How would that, how would that impact the church's enemies? The fact that this, this one who is present among the churches is, has, is all seeing, knows everything, sees everything that's happening. Do they care? <laughs> well, that's, if they did, what would it mean to them? <laughs> we will see that they will care. Yes. By the they end of Revelation, they would want to become part of us. Yeah, they would want to become part of us. But it, yes, so it's terrifying, or should be, and will become terrifying. We'll see that when uh, Christ starts unleashing the judgments. Um, that it's terrifying to them. Uh, they know why they're being judged. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Again, I go back to like the the plagues. It's like, you know, they knew why they were being judged with those plagues. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. God's God's gonna He's gonna come through with His word. He's like, oh, I'm gonna give you, you know, sea of blood. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't that Pharaoh and the Egyptians were ignorant of why they were being judged. They just didn't believe that they were going to be judged. Yeah. And when the judgment started coming, well, there was reason to be terrified. We're, we're going through the Bible, and we're in Jeremiah right now. And in Jeremiah, the Lord told them to, to do something, and they didn't believe him, and so they didn't do it. Well, this is after uh, 86, the last um, time that they were conquered. Right. And then he tells them, he, and he tells Jeremiah to tell these people again that they shouldn't go to Egypt. And they don't believe it. <laughs> Did it, it anyway, <laughs> yes. So ignorant. I, mean, I know. <laughs> you know, that's why, that's why um, it's not it's not an overstatement to describe uh, our condition in, 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 our, in our depravity as spiritual insanity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Satan is, spiritually insane uh, with this explosive temper, uh, this explosive rage going after the people of God, even though He's already been judged. He's already been kicked out of heaven. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's spiritual insanity. That's all, that's all you can call it. Because uh, you're right. It it there's nothing logical about it. Okay. Now his feet. It, uh, in verse 15, it says. John says his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. Now, there's different things that people bring out when they're talking about his feet, different features of this description of his feet. Uh, first of all, the bronze is a strong metal. It's, it's, it's uh, stronger than copper. Uh, it's a copper alloy. And um, it uh, is a strong metal, and uh, it's he, with it he's able to crush his enemies. But it's talking about his feet, and where he's also pictured in verse twelve as being in the midst of the lampstands. So 
So, uh, so it could, it could, uh, it could show, it could indicate uh, him uh, moving amongst his people. It could indicate, uh, um, I mean, the strength to move amongst his people, the strength to crush his enemies. And uh, also people point to the fact of uh, the, the description of it being refined in a furnace that would that normally that description normally emphasizes the purity of it and so uh probably what he's indicating here is his feet are uh uh show that he is quite able to be moving amongst his people crushing his enemies and in all of his judgments and actions with his people and uh, against his enemies are pure judgments, pure actions, emphasizes the purity of his actions and judgments. So. But if you related it all to that verse, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of him that brings good news. Yeah, I don't know. It sounds, mm -hmm. they sound beautiful. Yeah, well, in a sense, you know, because it's the feet, it's the it's the people coming with the good net, good message, so emphasizing their coming, uh, their movement, and so you know it could be it could be related to that that way his movement among his people, and 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 using. Uh, the description of bronze and bronze, um, not only bronze, but bronze refined in the furnace can emphasize his, his strength, how, uh, how uh, uh, he doesn't, his feet don't wear out moving amongst his people and his, his actions, and nor do they, nor do they wear no, nor are they incapable of crushing his enemies, and 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 uh, all of his actions, movements among his people, and and actions against his enemies are pure. Yeah. So, Mike, does the burning does the burnished burnished bronze add, add anything to it? Is that just because it's pure, or is that the yes, product the of being refined in a fire? Uh, it emphasizes the purity. So, so what what many what many say is that the feet, the the bronze feet, indicate um, uh, him moving amongst his people, uh, and his feet not wearing out doing that, and uh, the strength of his feet to crush his enemies. And then uh, in both of those things, both his actions amongst his churches and his judgments against his enemies are uh, the, the bronze having been burnished in a, fi in a furnace indicates the, the purity of those actions and judgments. Yeah, okay. By the way, when people say something in the back there, could you repeat it for us? Oh, yes. Thank you. That's a good reminder. Do you want me to start from six and repeat all of the things that have been... I'm kidding. I wouldn't be able better, to do that anyway. <laughs> you better be. <laughs> okay. We go on in verse... 15 and says uh, and his voice was like the roar of many waters um, the and, and we see this kind of a description uh, throughout the Old Testament uh, I mean throughout the Bible uh, in the Old Testament uh, Daniel described some of the angels their voices as being uh, like the sound of many waters. Um, 
the the point of that is what do you think is what what would you um suggest maybe the point of that i don't know if any of you had some suggestions at your at your fingertips here that you wanted to give before i blurt it out uh maybe like his voice can be heard from anywhere yeah yeah his voice can be heard from anywhere what'd you say pam so oh, oh nick said his voice maybe it it refers to his voice that his voice can be heard from anywhere yes powerful it's powerful yes and i think both of those things are right that that his voice is powerful and inescapable it was interesting i was listening to don carson talk about this and and of course don carson is canadian and he uh he's canadian and he um um uh, was talk so he was talking about niagara falls and he was saying you know it's very powerful very loud but you could still stand next to a person and carry on the conversation and both of you could hear it, hear each other so it wasn't overpowering in the sense that it drowned everybody out of course you had to be standing next to the person but you could have a normal conversation with them and hear each other he says but no matter where you went around the falls area the, the greater falls area you couldn't escape the sound of the falls it was that powerful it was inescapable it was heard everywhere to use the words that uh, that uh, nick used so but now in verse 11 how did he does he describe the glorified Christ's voice. Oh, you, mean, you mean 10? Yeah. 10? I thought it was verse 11. Oh, yeah. I mean 10. <laughs> Didn't you know that? <laughs> verse 10. No wonder it was, I was thinking. What it, why is this so hard? <laughs> like, a like a trumpet. He said, I heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet. Then he turned. He heard the voice say something, and the voice was like a trumpet. Then he heard, then he turned and saw this one like a son of man glorified. Uh, Can you so, what that sounds like, though? Like, I. Let me ask you this. Let me just throw this out. Let me just throw this out. You know, brass in an orchestra, brass can be very powerful, very loud. Sometimes in orchestras, they shield uh, uh, some of the other instruments from. I mean, I, I pity the poor wind instruments because many times in an orchestra, they're sitting in front of the brass section uh, of an orange orchestra. So uh, a trumpet can be powerful and all of that. But if you were comparing the sound of, um, what's the description he uses in verse 15? The, the roar of many waters, that sound with the sound of the trumpet, maybe what's, what, would you think, how do you think that those would differ? Would it be like a forceful, you know, how the, the force, forceful of the sound of the trumpet and also of the water, the force of it? That's how they're similar. That's how they're similar. How are they distinct? How would you distinguish? They're both powerful, forceful sounds. What's the difference? Melodious comes to my mind, but I don't think that's probably it. But you're getting close. How about clarity? Clarity. The a trumpet sound is much clearer. 
there's much more clarity to a note that the sump that a trumpet sounds than there is to the sounds that a roaring waterfalls makes, right? Uh, so uh, we gather from this that 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 uh, Christ's voice is clear, it's powerful, it's clear, and it's inescapable. Clear, powerful, and inescapable. Wonder what it's going to be like in heaven. Wonder what it's going to be like talking to each other in heaven. Because we're going to be glorified beings. This type of voice in the old in the in the Bible isn't just attributed to the glorified Christ, but also to angels that uh, that um, uh, spoke to the prophets, who gave visions to the prophets in the Old Testament. Sorry, that's my dishwasher. <laughs> it says I'm done. <laughs> but what a clear note. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, for this reason and many other reasons, there won't be any need of hearing aids in heaven. That's good, because it's something else to be turning it up and down. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, there's that trumpet. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, and then... And then um, Going on in verse 16, he says, in his right hand, he held seven stars. I'm going to defer that until we get to verse 20, explaining that. But, but what I do want to point out is that he's holding these stars in his right hand. And that's significant. The right hand is considered the hand of power. Probably because most people were right-handed. Uh, but um, for whatever reason, and that sounds as good a reason as any, uh, the right hand was considered the hand of power. So not only was he holding these seven stars, but he was holding them in, the hand, in his hand of power. So we'll return to that when we get down to verse 20. Um, when John comments gives us more information about the stars. Uh, then he says, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And uh, that feature more than, probably more than anything else, tips us off that we're, that we're dealing with a symbolic description, right? And, and not a literal description of uh, the glorified Christ. Can you imagine? If it was literal. Um, so, um, what what are things about this sword that that he mentions that maybe we that that should go into our understanding of what he's talking about, of what he's referring to. It's a component of his speech that's coming from his mouth. Right. Very good. Very. Pardon? Oh, uh, Ian said that um, that it's a component of his speech because it comes from his mouth, and that's exactly right. It is his spoken word. Why? would he characterize his spoken word with a two-edged sword? It would be like a defense. I'm thinking of the armor of God, that's all. Oh, so only in the armor of God is the sword of the spirit a defense? It's actually our only offensive weapon. Only offensive part of the... 
It's like his spoken word. Remember in Hebrews chapter 4, I believe verse 12, we're told that, uh, that the word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Remember that? So he's, he's characterizing Christ's spoken word the same as his written word. Okay. Why two edging? I mean, one reason is that's that's the big offensive weapon that they use. This this uh, big two edge sword that cuts both ways you swing it. Um, First of all, I, I think I think we're we're told like in is it Hosea? Might be Hosea, where we're told that um, God's word heals and harms. It does both. It destroys and saves. It heals and harms. It cuts both ways. Um, clearly in Revelation 19, we have, when it talks about, um, uh, let's see, 19 verse, at least I thought it did. Maybe I'm remembering wrong. No, no. Verse 15, 19, 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword doesn't say two-edged, but from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So um, the picture there in Revelation 19 is he's going to judge and destroy the nations with his spoken word. The fact that it comes from his mouth means that it's his spoken word. And the fact that it's a it's a, a sharp sword that strikes the nations indicates the execution of that judgment. He speaks judgment and it happens. It's executed. That's what's going to happen when he returns. Okay. Is that the is that the same sword as in Matthew ten that Wes was talking about? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look at the Greek. I will look. Well, I just did. I looked at the Greek and couldn't make any sense out of it. <laughs> <laughs> did the words look the same? <laughs> uh, okay, but I'll, I'll have to look at the Greek be, between now and next, next uh, week. But anyway, so that's probably the sense of the two-edged sword is that, that it both heals and harms. And, and we see that, we see that in his letters to the churches. There's much in his letters that's meant to heal. But there's also warnings of judgment if they don't repent. Is it like saying the word of God can either save you or condemn you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your repetition. Uh, uh, Julie, Julie asked, is that like uh, the word of God can either save you or condemn you? And that's exactly right. It, it, can, it, can, it can save or condemn. It can uh, heal or harm. Uh, and so... Um, that's uh, the type of speech that comes from the glorified Christ's mouth is, is speech that can heal or harm uh, and speech that's not wasted, that's not ineffective. What he speaks happens. Um, whether it's healing or harming, okay? 
And then uh, the last thing he says in verse uh, 18 is that his face, um, did I say 18? I meant 16. The last thing he says in verse 16, he says that his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Um, any ideas? As, uh, I don't know if any of you already had ideas you wanted to share or that comes to you right now and you wanted to share uh, about what, why he would describe his face like that. What is that supposed to portray to us? His glory, yes. Julie said his glory, and that and that's right. Um, his his glory uh, is, and 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 here I think we have a part representing the whole. That is, I think his whole body is shining like like this he's just using the face to represent the whole person um his the outshining of his glory is such that um it's painful to gaze upon uh, or hard to gaze upon um and so um uh, it is, uh, it is painful, radiant brightness uh, that, uh, that uh, strikes you when you gaze upon his face. It's like looking at, trying to stare at the sun. Who does that? It, interesting story. Don't know if it's true or not. I heard this from Don Carson. But uh, interesting story. Um, uh, I think it was the Emperor Trajan, and I forget whether he was second century or third century, whether he was in the 100s or the 200s. I forget now. Um, but uh, a lot of the pagan world viewed Christians as atheists because you couldn't see their gods, their God was invisible. Show me your God. You can't show me your God. And and uh, and Trajan, um, in particular, was giving this one Jew a hard time about that. And so finally, we're giving the Jews a hard time about that. And so finally, this one old Jew, old Jew, told um, this old one old Christian told. Um, Trajan, I meant Christian, not Jew, uh, told Trajan, um, um, if, if you can gaze uh, a good long while on one of his emissaries, I will show you our God. And Trajan was all over that. Of course, man. And so the Christian told him the sun. And of course, Trajan couldn't just stare long at the sun. Uh, and the point being is, is that the point that that Jew, that that Christian was making to Trajan is, is that uh, uh, God is such a glorious God, you can't view him uh without it uh, uh affecting you without it hurting you um and anyway whether that story is true or not uh, supposedly it is and it, it certainly silenced trajan the emperor uh but that's and i'm and i'm sure where that christian got that idea was right here uh, in, in, um, in uh, John's description of the glorified Christ. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool, uh, especially if it's true.
<laughs> right. He just got to. Yeah. Julie said he told Moses to hide behind rocks so he couldn't see him. He only got to see his afterglow. Yeah. So. Anyway. Um, Grant Osborne makes this comment in his commentary. He makes this comment about this description of the glorified Christ. He says, this opening vision sets the tone for much of what follows, and details of it will be repeated in several of the letters, and we'll see that when we go through chapters two and three. He says, and I like this, he says, this becomes the official portrait of the glorified Christ. He is depicted as the end time sovereign and judge of the world. The rest of the visions in the book elaborate on these descriptive snapshots. Uh, so we'll see that anyway. Um, and that, remember, was supposed to encourage um, his readers getting this vision. Um, but to see this, let's... Let's go into verses 17 and 18. First of all, any questions on verses 12 through 16 regarding the description of the, of, uh, the glorified Christ? Other than the stars. We'll get to the stars when we hit verse 20. But uh, any other question about that description? Uh, I just have one about the right-hand thing. So... Did was that used as because it's the dominant because it's the dominant hand? <laughs> um, so God used that as to kind of like you know have people relate to understand that that this was power because it was such a dominant hand. The majority of people used it. So um, <clears throat> Nick is asking in in uh, verse sixteen. Um, when it says he held the stars in his right hand, was he using the right hand uh, because it's the dominant hand and it shows his power? And the answer to that would be yes. And I'm assuming that what also is behind that is that most kings held the scepter in their right hand. Most warrior kings carried their sword in their right hand. Uh, so, um, so the, the, the right hand became associated with power, right? I think we do have some, I think in the Old Testament, if my memory serves me correctly, we do have some mention in the Old Testament of left-handed people. I mean... I'm not saying uh, like it was a noteworthy thing. They were able to do this with their left hand. I'll have to look that up. Anyway. Okay, let's go on to verses 17 and 18 and, and discuss uh, what kind of an impact Christ intended for this vision of himself to have. We see in verses 17 and 18, John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Um, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Um, so, um, in our notes, um, the effect of the vision, uh, verses 17 and 18, seeing the glorified Christ had, oh, okay, I see what I'm saying. 
seeing the glory. <laughs> I was reading the word seeing, uh, not the correct way. <laughs> seeing the glorified Christ had the same effect on John as the vision of glorious angels had on Daniel. I'll let you look up those verses in, 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 if you haven't already and, and look at them. But Daniel was falling down too on his face. Um, so uh, the, the effect is the effect of, of seeing a glorious being like that. Um, so we, can't, we cannot imagine what that was like. Um, of course, um, we're not going, it's not going to have the same effect on us when we get translated and uh, find ourselves in the presence of Christ and uh, of, of the Trinity and the holy angels. Why? When we get translated and brought into their very presence, why won't, won't it affect us the way it affected? I mean, we will worship. We will fall down and worship. But uh, clearly, that was more what, what John and Daniel was doing was more than just that. Is I mean, it because we won't have our sin nature anymore? Yeah, that's part of it. Yep. We will, we will be a glorified being. Uh, so we will be fit to be in their presence. We will be without sin and in a glorified state. We'll be fit to be in their presence. Uh, uh, John, in his first letter, chapter 3, um, and I'm thinking um, of verse 2, but let me start in verse 1. John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did, did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. So when we see Christ, we will be like him. So... Yes, we will fall down and worship, but we won't fall down dead like Daniel and John and, and these other prophets that, that uh, were ushered into the presence suddenly uh, of, of incredibly glorious beings. Um, that's, that's pretty incredible to think, you know? Uh, and... And we have that status right now. You look around this room. You're sitting amongst royalty. Yeah. You know that? You're sitting amongst the children of God. Royalty. But it has not appeared yet what we're going to look like. But when he appears, we will be alike him, for we will see him as he is. And we won't fall down dead. That's, that's pretty amazing. Pretty astounding. Um, uh, as one country boy said, if that doesn't get your fire going, your wood's wet. <laughs> I haven't used that for a long yeah. time. <laughs> well, I, I picked up what you laid down. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't used that for yeah, a long time. Either. So in verse 17, in the second half of verse 17, uh, what two things did Christ do to reassure and strengthen John. He touched him and he spoke to him. 
Yeah, and what did he say to him when he spoke to him? Fear not. Fear not. Yes, exactly. And, and I heard Nick say yeah. that he used his right hand. So here's the picture. John falls down dead, and Christ reaches out with his hand of power and touches John and says, fear not. That's, that's amazing. Those were the first words out of Jesus' mouth to John. Fear not. Uh, his first words out of his mouth after John sees him is fear not. Uh, and I wonder, I wonder what happened to the stars when Jesus reached out and touched him. I'm just kidding. Uh, um, <laughs> John was covered with stars. Stardust. He started flying. He patted him on the shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so then he told him to uh, fear not. So what, this, this next question, uh, what grounds did Christ provide for John not being afraid? He reached out with his hand of power and touched John on the shoulder and told him, fear not. And then what grounds did uh, Jesus give him for not being afraid? He has the keys to death. Say that again. He has the keys to death. Yes, he has the keys to death. And how is it that he came to have the keys of death in Hades? Pardon? He defeated death. Uh, um, Nick said he defeated death. Yes. He says, I am the first and the last and the living one. I love the way he described himself like that. I am the <coughs> living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Death and hell. I've got the keys of death and hell. Um, they describe, I mean, uh, you can read um, the story of uh, the, um, the martyrdom of Polycarp, one of the very early church fathers. Polycarp, he was a, a disciple of John the Baptist. And I believe Poly, Polycarp was at Smyrna. I can't, I'll have to look that up. But I think that's where Polycarp was. But anyway, um, um, he was arrested uh, for refusing to engage in, uh, he was arrested for uh, his Christianity. Well, what, the same thing John was exiled for, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Polycarp was arrested for that, brought before the provincial govern, governor there in Asia Minor, and, and the governor, who happened to like Polycarp, uh, uh, appealed to Polycarp uh, to, to just burn the incense, just burn some incense, just do this one thing and I can let you go. He didn't want to, he didn't want to have to execute Polycarp. And I, I forget Polycarp's first response to the governor, but then the gover governor tried to pressure him. And so he threatened first the beasts, the lions, and then fire. And Polycarp's response to him was, you threaten me with the fire that lasts one hour, and you forget the fire of eternal hell. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the significance of the fact that Christ has the keys to death and hell. Even if 
Our enemies try to lock us up in the prison of death. Christ has the keys and he unlocks the door. So the governor uh, had Polycarp burned to the stake, but Polycarp went right into the presence of this glorified risen Christ because so you can see what kind of effect that that this this vision was to have on Jesus's followers and definitely had on uh, people like Polycarp and the other martyrs. What was that effect? Just to put it in a phrase. Take away their fear. Because what is the worst threat a regime can make against you? What's the worst thing he can threaten you with? Taking your life. And Jesus says, fear not. I am the first and the last. I had the first word. I spoke creation into existence, and I will have the last word. I'm the living one. I died and am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and hell. There, there's, a, there's a line in the song that I've always remembered. It's, you know, they can take your life, but you know, they, can, they can't take what you believe in. You know, so right. And, and, you know, that's that's true. <laughs> they took they took Christ's life, but he rose again and said, oh, I'm still here." <laughs> so, well, what did, Nick, what did Nick say? Um, they, he said there's a line in a song. What's the line again? Tell me line again. Is that they can take they can take your life, but they can't take what you believe in. Did you hear that? They can take your life, but they cannot take what you believe in. I was thinking this morning when we were, and we're going to end here, we will start chapter two next week, but only after we discuss verses 19 and 20 of chapter one first, but we will start chapter two. So you will get notes for chapter two and three this week. Uh, but, but let me close with, with, with this. Um, I was thinking this morning, just in line with what Nick said, uh, this line in this song that says, "Say it again." Oh, they can take what, they can take your life, but they can't take what you believe. In. Yeah, they can take your life, but they can't take what you believe in. Um, and I was thinking about that when we were talking about communion this morning. Uh, what communion is is spiritual dining, and I was thinking that's the kind of dining, this fellowship that we have, have with Christ and with others over the word, uh, even though they can restrict maybe the venue of our gathering, this spiritual dining is the kind of dining that no virus and no government can touch. Yeah. They can't take that spiritual dining away from us. And, and when it comes to the marriage, Feast of the Lamb, that will be dining at its very finest. Um, so anyway, yes. So you can see how that would that would encourage them. It was designed to take away their fear and embolden them. Uh, so those are, I love verses 17 and 18. What tremendous grounds for us not to be afraid. Um, it's like what what Jesus said. Was it was it Luke twelve or Luke? I think it might be Luke four and twelve four and five, where he said, "Do not fear those who can uh, man who can at most take your." I'm paraphrasing. Take your life. He says, "I tell you who to uh, who to fear." Fear God, because after taking your life, he can cast you into hell fire. And so this kind of description and this encouragement that he gave John 
in verses 17 and 18 was to uh, uh, make us see who Christ really is, what he really is like, and it's designed to take away our fear and embolden us in regarding the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So we'll just end uh, right there. Um, Philip, you still there? And he's gone. I No, I'm here. I'm oh, okay. Here. Uh, would you like to close us in prayer? Yes, please. Father, what... Um... What just absolutely imponderable thoughts and truths these are that you're uh, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and you hold the keys of, of Hades and death. And death doesn't have any more sting for us. We, your, your, your sacrifice on the cross and your death, burial, and resurrection vi signals victory over death, hell, and the grave. Thank you for that. And it also as Mike taught us uh, last week, it empowers us to follow you and um, in, 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 in like a manner uh, that you walked, Jesus. And what a privilege it is. Part of that is um, getting together like this and fellowshipping with each other, loving each other through the word. And thank you for Michael and, and Deepak as they, they br help bring this message study a lot and brings it to us in simplicity. Thank you for Father, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Yes.